Well, you know, they've done well with all the, you know, coronavirus and everything that's happened to them. I think the key to the Cardinals were getting the best 13 pitchers healthy by the time the playoffs start. And then I think they got a heck of a chance because they're deeper and got more really good middle relief pitchers than anybody else. And uh, they haven't had that. Uh, Mike's had to use some guys that I know he to put other people in. So their record's deceiving. But the way the playoffs are set up, the 60-game schedule don't mean much because they're going to have eight, play, uh, eight teams from each league in the playoffs, which means eight out of 15 teams. So you're going to have some f under 500 teams in the playoffs. I like the Cardinals. But I, uh, they got to get, uh, right now, when you look at their stats, their three, four, five, and six hitters are all hitting 300. The second hitter is hitting 275. The seventh hitter is hitting 280. That's a pretty good lineup. And uh, Wong, of course, last night, he got four for four. He's over 250. And he's about a 270, 80 hitter. He ends up there every year, and despite the fact he's very streaky at times. But the big key for the Cardinals is going to be, I think, their middle relief. When they get everybody healthy, I think that's going to be a big plus to the Cardinals in the playoffs. Uh, second here, just double checking here. Testing one, two, three. Good, looking good. Okay, um, what do you see when you see uh, Paul Goldschmidt right now? Well, last year Goldschmidt struck out about 165 times. Uh, and he's cut that down right now. He's, uh, he's cut his strikeout ratio down per bat to about one out of six and a half, which is a big jump. That means he's more relaxed. Last year, early in the season, they were throwing a lot of fastballs by him. His on-base percentage is phenomenal. I mean, he's got uh, 14 walks and 80 at-bats. Um, that's something that it didn't happen to him much last year because he struck out an awful lot. But he's more relaxed, he's more selective, and you know, people raise uh, Kane about a guy like Schmo, uh, Goldschmidt, who, who, who had you hitting? Well, early in the season, you know, last year he had Ozuma hitting behind him, and uh, early in the season he had O'Neill hitting behind him, and. They say, well, he, you know, he has no protection. But now, when you got Miller hitting like he is and the threat that he's been against uh, right-hand pitching, Goldschmidt's getting a lot better pitches to hit. Yeah, tell me about Miller. How do you uh, explain what we're seeing here? Well, Miller's been like a utility player because when you talk about defense, I guess he's got a knock that maybe he's not an elite defensive guy at second base. But I see him as an adequate player. He doesn't have the range, maybe. He's played third base pretty well. He had a, he's had a couple of scatter arms at first, but he's a good hitter. You know, when you look at his record as a player, uh, I think one year as a utility guy, and then he worked himself into a record. He hit 30 home runs. So that's nothing to sneeze at, although the way the ball's hopped up and the home runs that are hit today, I mean, a home run doesn't mean as much as it used to 25 years ago. Still counts a run, though. <laughs> <laughs> How would you handle Carpenter at this stage if you're the manager, knowing what he has accomplished and what you're seeing now? Well, basically, the first five years that Carp played for the Cardinals, not only was he their best hitter, he was their best clutch hitter. Uh, one year, he led the league in hits with 197. Of those 90, 197 hits, he had 97 two-strike hits. But in those days, he owned the middle of the plate to the inside corner. He, they couldn't pitch him inside, and they kept trying to do that. Then they went to the shift, because he hit 35 home runs, and all of a sudden, I don't think he ever realized or thought that he would hit 35 home runs in a season. And they start pitching him hard away. And he has trouble handling that pitch because he tries to pull it. 
and he kind of hooks the bat a little bit. When I say hook, he kind of lo loses a level swing. He ain't got much uh, to make contact with. When you hook the bat on an outside pitch, you got to go with that pitch and try to drill it a ground ball, not a fly ball in the left center field or through shortstop. Ah, so Harp's a very intelligent kid, and I, I know he's pressing, I know he's looking, I know he... But I am surprised, to be honest with you, after the way he played last year, and he went from 30 home runs to 12, and now he's hitting less than 200 again. That surprises me, because he's a much better hitter than that. One of these outfielders, either Bader, O'Neill, or Carlson, or maybe Thomas, is going to have to hit. Anybody you really like that could actually hit before the end of the year? Well, I'm glad they're giving uh, Thomas a chance because I like his fundamentals. I know he's got the coronavirus coming over that. I know he jumped right out of bed kind of into the lineup. He's going to get off slow. But uh, last year when I watched him pinch hit, when I watched him get to play, not many opportunities, but when he played, I thought he's fundamentals of hitting were very good, and I think he's a heck of an athlete. Uh, he could very easily end up being the regular center fielder because as much as I love Bader, and uh, you know, I, I root for him, I, I think I pull more for him than I did my grandsons when they played ball. And I want him to succeed with the bat, and uh, he's still striking out one out of three times. And uh, I think Bader could be successful if he went to the plate and thought about hitting every ball hard to the second baseman. Not becoming a punch and Judy, but trying to take a good swing and hit it. Because you notice when he hit the three home runs three days in a row, they were to center field and right center. And if he would, he, he's up there most of the time, he gets 2-0, and oh, and he's trying to jerk the ball, and he hits so many balls to the third baseman. But his greatest asset as a player is his speed. And when you pull the ball to the third baseman, you don't get out of the batter's box. When you hit the ball to the second baseman, you're running the first base when you hit the ball. And I think that his speed alone would make him a hitter that would keep him in the lineup every day if he just speed out some of them hits to second base and shortstop. I want to ask you about uh, Dylan Carlson. Uh, what are you seeing there? And it's too early to draw any conclusions, I imagine, right? Well, first of all, he came up at an inopportune time. You know, no minor leagues. It might have been different if he'd have been playing every day at AAA. And unfortunately, he got off to a bad start, about three for 30 or something like that, had opportunities to drive in runs. But there's a lot of things I like about him, even the fact that he's not really hitting yet. He, first of all, he's been pressing something terrible. Secondly, they're throwing him a lot of off-speed pitches and curveballs. And but when I watch him and I watch his fundamentals, the fact that he's a switch hitter, he's not overmatched. I mean, as far as he doesn't have a pitch weakness that I don't think he won't overcome. I think he's going to really be a fine ball player. You know, he's just the fact that he was their number one prospect, and the press was you know, wanting him to get up, and they weren't going to keep him because they wanted to wait two weeks so he'd have another year before he's eligible for uh, arbitration and so forth and free agency. But he'll be all right. But uh, he needs about two or three blue pits to get him going, then he might go into terror. Is what we're seeing out of Yadier Molina at age 38 and now hitting 300, is he amazing you? Yachty amazes me because yeah, I'm not going to talk about his age because, you know, he's an amazing player. But the funny thing with Yachty, even the games that he catches after night games, he seems to have his best days offensively. I, I think right now, I really think Yachty should have a day off. Uh, there's some balls getting by him that wouldn't get by him. 
I don't think that his arm strength, that his arm might be a little hard. He's made two or three throws a second where the ball's drifting a little bit to right field. Let's just give him a rain out or a day off or something. I think that would help him in that respect. But he's an amazing athlete. He loves to play. Pretty darn nice to have a 38-year-old catcher that's uh, still at the top of his game and tells the manager he wants to be in the lineup every day. How about what you're seeing out of Paul the Young? You know, the 30 home runs last year, and now he's catching fire after coming off COVID. What do you, what do you see with him? Well, I'm impressed with him defensively. I always have been. He's got a good home run swing. He's not very selective. He doesn't walk much. His home base percentage will never be much. Last year, uh, he was off to a great start. He, he did hit 30 home runs. You can't sneeze at that. But by the same token, his on base percentage and his batting average went down tremendously the last two months of the season. Might have been because he might have needed a little bit more rest than they were able to give him. I was impressed uh, this year when he did have the coronavirus, how good that uh, that he, uh, Edmund played at shortstop. He, he just played like he played there all his life, and uh, he did a great job. He almost looked like Mike Ramsey when, Mike, uh, when Ozzy was out for two weeks and we had seven doubleheaders, and he played about 19 games in 15 days and didn't make an error. Tommy Edmonds could have played for Whitey Ball, don't you think? He would have been a perfect player. Tommy Edmonds is something. You know, now, he's an aggressive kid. Uh, he, he hasn't hit the home runs that he hit last year. He's getting more curveballs. But he don't have trouble picking up the curveball. He's fouled a lot of them off. You know, he's not really been uh, as hot as he was, but they're pitching him a lot different. But he's hitting 275 again right now. He, he's in an Every time they seem to have a, a rally, he's in on it some way. When Adam Wainwright passed Bob Porsche, Willie McGee told Waino that he reminds him of Porsche. Do you see any similarities there? Well, well they're both right-handed, <laughs> and they're both over six feet tall. Um, Bob Porsche came up to the big leagues. I didn't see him. I was in the other league, but I do know from what I hear, and a little bit I did see him on TV, Frank. He was a plus fastball pitcher. And then by the time I got here, he was maybe down to 88, 89 as a fastball guy. But he had a good slider. And uh, he became a veteran pitcher like Wainwright has, learned to use the fastball, but throw breaking balls, sliders, and curve balls on fastball counts. And when you're a veteran and you can throw about 90, and you can set up that fastball and use both sides of the plate, you can get use that fastball to get a lot of outs. And that, that's what reminds me of Wainwright right now. The last three years, or two years, he's come back from uh, 88 to 87 velocity to 90, 91. That makes his curveball better, but he really learned how to use both sides of the plate with his fastball. Um. Do you think Jack Flaherty is a, a superstar and a potential great pitcher for years and years? Well, sometimes, <laughs> you know, right now he could be 4-0. You know, they haven't scored for him and took him out one time where he needed it out, just like with the Dakota, you know, 74 pitches, take him out. They baby him a lot. They're so afraid they're going to hurt him by pitching him too many innings. But I think he's the kind of guy that if he's out there, and I don't think it hurts those guys.